As many of you know, I'm Connie King, Curator of Women's History at the Library Company. I really appreciate this opportunity to give you a virtual tour of the Women Get Things Done exhibition. We timed the show to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. It's hard to believe, but I started working on the show four years ago. In 2016, I was fascinated by the fact that many women apparently opposed the idea of a woman running for president. The public conversations reminded me of similar discussions about gender roles in 19th century America. I'm very grateful to the library company for giving me the chance to explore the large topic of what can women do. For the show, I particularly wanted to examine the famous 19th century suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, in the context of their now less well-known contemporaries. But first, I have so many people to thank. Our sponsors, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, and Stieg Thompson for their generous support. All my colleagues at the library company, Mike Barsanti, Jim Green, and Rachel Hammer, for encouraging me to go forward, especially after our being closed due to COVID. Emily Smith for the wonderful photography and scanning, some of which you've already seen in the promotional material. Big thanks also go to our freelance designer, Barb Barnett, and our in-house designer, Katie Maxwell. I'm also grateful to Barb Barnett for finalizing the online version of the show ahead of schedule so systems librarian Tristan Dunn could get it linked to the website and summer intern Lydia Shaw could work with me and Sophia Dahab on a series of social media posts that we called Women Get Things Done Wednesdays. I'm especially grateful to former library company fellow, Dr. Amy Sobsek Joseph, who has been a terrific collaborator through the whole process. And also my in-house editor, M. Ricciardi. I want to thank Steve Ferguson of Princeton University Libraries for getting Princeton's full run of the magazine, The Lily Digitized, so we could include it on a touch screen in the gallery. I know Steve is a library company member, so I hope he's watching tonight. I also want to be sure to thank my reading room colleagues, Jasmine Smith and Ainsley Akins for their moral support, and Jennifer Rosner, together with Alice Austin and Andrea Krupp. Thanks to them, the gallery looks amazing, literally ready for prime time. And finally, I'd like to thank Davida Deutsch, whose support has meant so much to me and to the library company's program in women's history. Davida, thanks for making it possible for me to get things done. So now let me start with the walkthrough. The history of the women's suffrage movement has often been told with a focus on Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But there were many other noteworthy women who were not affiliated with them and their organizations. This exhibition, Women Get Things Done, Women's Activism from 1860 to 1880, primarily tells their stories and examines the public conversations about women's capabilities. There are four sections in the show. What can women do? What can women do for others? What can women do for themselves? And what more can women do? The first section, What Can Women Do?, focuses on the many women who sought to expand the areas in which women could work to support themselves. Needlework was often considered the most gender appropriate work for women. For decades, reformers had noted 
that it was low paying and demanding work. In the 1840s, the use of the home sewing machine had only intensified the problem. With the mechanization of many industries, women were still most likely to perform the tasks that involve sewing, again, for low pay. You see here that there are men operating printing presses and uh, many more women sewing shoes or sewing book bindings. A few remarkable women, notably Carolyn Dahl, Virginia Penny, and Martha Rain, made it their mission to expand the range of socially acceptable female occupations in order to empower women through economic independence. I particularly want to mention Virginia Penny and her book, 500 Employments Adapted to Women. Virginia Penny used her own inheritance to interview employers and circulate questionnaires to determine which jobs were available where women could have equal opportunities with men. She conducted literally thousands of interviews. I love the passage I highlight in the show. She writes, it is surprising how many objections as regards health and physical strength required can be presented by selfish men who do not wish women to engage in their occupation. The 500 occupations Penny recommends for women include art, especially work in industrial arts, business, law, medicine, and I looked for it, library work. Librarians are number 16, listed between lecturers and magazine contributors. And of course, that's one of the many reasons I think Virginia Penny's book is so wonderful. The second section of the show, Doing for Others, focuses on how women's volunteer work, especially during the Civil War, led to paid careers following the war especially in the fields of medicine and organized philanthropy. I love this image from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. That's an artist depiction of an event that took place in New York City about two weeks after the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in May 1861. According to the accompanying article, 3,000 women showed up for a meeting at Cooper Union to discuss the ways they could help the Union cause. The following month, the United States Sanitary Commission was created to continue the work raising funds, caring for the sick and wounded, and soliciting the donation of items such as homemade hospital gowns. They, uh, the commission uh, in its bulletin published this pattern. The Sanitary Commission held fairs in many northern cities, raising millions of dollars for the union cause. People who know Philadelphia lithographs are probably familiar with this image of the Great Central Fair held in Philadelphia in 1864. It was held on Logan Square, and, and you can see the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul in the background. After the war, many Civil War nurses led the way to the professionalization of nursing. Here are some late 1880s photographs depicting young professional nurses who would have been born right after the war. After the war, many books also appeared documenting the importance of women's wartime work. By and large, they focused on white women's contributions, which obscured the fact that many black women also contributed to the war effort, including Harriet Tubman. In fact, a good case can be made that when Tubman worked with the Union forces in South Carolina, her ability to gain information about the location and movement of Confederate forces from the local black population was a crucial factor in the outcome of the war. The third section of the show focuses on women doing things for themselves. 
during the war, not all women were raising money, making hospital gowns, nursing wounded soldiers, or spying behind enemy lines. Some women were seemingly unaffected by the war. Jane Crowley, shown here, was an editor for a fashion magazine, Madame Demarest's Mirror of Fashions, and her columns didn't even mention the war. For Jane Crowley, what prompted her to act at Bism occurred much later in 1868, when the New York Press Club excluded women journalists from a dinner the club held to honor Charles Dickens. Crowley was outraged, and she founded one of the first women's clubs the following month. It was called Cirrhosis, spelled S-O-R-O-S-I-S. That's uh, from the Latin word for sister. The backlash against cirrhosis, a club which was created by women to help women, may seem surprising today. Harper's published this satiric cartoon in May the following year. In the background, you see a man taking care of an infant, while women engage in various organizing activities. There's a lot going on in this image. In the foreground, you can even see a woman reading Susan B. Anthony's periodical, The Revolution, the first issue of which came out in January 1868. Now that's not fa mm -hmm. fair at all to the women of cirrhosis mm -hmm. because Crowley and other cirrhosis members distanced themselves from the women's rights movement, judging it too bold and unfeminine. But ultimately, cirrhosis was political. In August 1869, cirrhosis convened the first meeting of what they called the Women's Parliament. The Women's Parliament was designed to address issues that related directly to women's sphere as defined in the 19th century. These issues included the importance of kindergartens and public education generally, help for working women, organized daycare, and home economics. The Harper's cartoon aside, cirrhosis and other women's clubs often did manage to escape criticism, but because they conform so closely to long-standing traditions of women and philanthropy. And like I said, the members themselves distanced uh, themselves from the radical women demanding voting rights for women or even running for president, as Victoria Woodhull did in 1872. The fourth section, What More Can Women Do?, examines the organizations that specifically sought to reorder society, unlike cirrhosis. Of particular interest are the abolition, the temperance, and the women's rights movements. When Susan B. Anthony organized the Women's New York State Temperance Society way back in the 1850s, the backlash was immediate and severe, in general suggesting that radical women wanted to usurp men's proper place in society. Popular culture couldn't get enough opportunities to ridicule the so-called radical women who purportedly wanted their husbands to put on frocks so they could wear their breeches. Consequently, generations of conservative women worked hard to prove that they were not affiliated with Susan B. Anthony and her ilk. During the Civil War, Stanton and Anthony who had long been supporters uh, and, and active in the abolition movement, organized the Women's Loyal League in support of the abolition of slavery. As soon as they had circulated petitions such as this one and collected 100,000 signatures, they submitted them to Congress as the first installment Eventually, the League submitted almost 400,000 names and Congress passed the 13th Amendment in January 1865. 
The following year, in 1866, the American Equal Rights Association brought activist men and women together to work on the next big project, universal suffrage, to end the disenfranchisement of black men and also women, both black and white. Some of the most prominent male and female leaders of the abolitionist and women's rights movements were among its members. But unfortunately, very, very unfortunately, the unity of purpose did not last. In 1869, the women's rights movement split into two factions. One faction argued that suffrage for black men was too important to risk a possible delay over woman suffrage. The other faction wanted the 15th Amendment to pass only if it gave all men and all women the right to vote. And that latter group was Stanton and Anthony's National Woman Suffrage Association. As we all know, the 15th Amendment was passed giving black men the vote in 1870, but leaving women still disenfranchised. But the split in the women's movement would not end until 1890. And ultimately, the successful push for voting rights for women wouldn't be until the 20th century, culminating in 1920. In the meantime, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, under the leadership of Frances Willard, grew to become the largest women's organization in 19th century America. Frances Willard used temperance as a wedge issue for a wide range of reform activities. Under her leadership, large numbers of conservative women moved into pro-suffrage activism without the stigma of radicalism. While other groups got mired in infighting, Willard expanded the tent. She successfully characterized women's activism as an extension of women's traditional roles as protectors of the home. She was a world-class organizer. The WCTU memorialized Willard by publishing this postcard in the years of renewed activism leading up to 1920. Willard's words still have meaning. The quote here is, alone we can do little. Separated we are units of weakness, but aggregated we become batteries of power. It's important to note, in conclusion, that many African-American men and women would remain disenfranchised for decades after 1920, and there are still impediments to voting for some populations today. It is also worth noting that the Equal Rights Amendment, first crafted by prominent 20th century suffragist Alice Paul, has never been ratified. So let me say it again. Alone, we can do little. Separated, we are units of weakness. But aggregated, we become batteries of power. Thank you for, for letting me share this with you tonight. And if you'd like the fuller experience, the exhibition is online. That's https librarycompany.org slash WGTD. Thank you.